On page 52, on page 52, which we covered already, we talked about how sensory neurons may synapse on the inner neurons. I said, what page are we? Page 52. Inner neurons may synapse onto motor neurons. Motor neurons can synapse onto effectors. You'd say, what's an effector? It's written right there. Any organ that has an effect. Muscles and glands. And we're going to talk about all these different types of synapses. We're going to start, though, with uh, the synapse or junction formed between the somatic motor neuron and skeletal muscle cells. And this is known as the neuromuscular junction. We learned previously that uh, another name for somatic motor neurons is alpha motor neurons or lower motor neurons. Uh, and um, if we look at page 50, uh, 53, on page 53, which we looked at last time, So it shows a somatic motor neuron. All, somatic, all motor neurons have a multipolar shape. All somatic motor neurons are myelinated, which means they have a fast conduction velocity, which also means they can be affected by demyelinating diseases like MS. Uh, and um, uh, we know that we talked about how each somatic motor neuron typically synapses and controls hundreds, sometimes thousands, of individual skeletal muscle cells. And we learned, and it's written on the previous page 52, that the motor, somatic motor neuron and all of the skeletal muscle cells it controls is called a motor unit. I said it was like a platoon. <clears throat> now, uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, we remind you that in the fluid surrounding cells, it's high in sodium ions. Right here, it's boxed in, and this is where the neuromuscular junction is, the synapse between the somatic motor neuron and some of the skeletal muscle cells. If we enlarge it or magnify it, it will look like the figure we see on the top right. On the figure on the top right, we can see how the synaptic knobs of the somatic motor neuron do not actually touch the uh, surface of the skeletal muscle cell membrane. There is a slight gap or cleft, a cleft or gap between the synaptic knobs and the skeletal muscle cell membrane. Uh, if we magnify this even more, so it looks like this. Again, you can see that the synaptic knobs do not actually make contact with the skeletal muscle cell membrane. Now, we also mentioned last time that on the skeletal muscle cell membrane, there are proteins. <clears throat> now, of course, we've learned that cell membranes, any cell membrane of any cell, is a phospholipid bilayer with various proteins embedded. Some of those proteins are receptor sites. Some of those proteins are ion channels. Some of those proteins are enzymes. Some of those proteins are transporter proteins. You can see how what we've spoken of previously and been tested on keeps reappearing. This is how we explain stuff. The, uh, the specifically on the skeletal muscle cell membranes are acetylcholine receptor sites, where the acetylcholine released from the somatic motor neuron synaptic knobs is going to attach and activate. And there's also an enzyme protein on the skeletal muscle cell membrane. It's called acetylcholinesterase. Now, the ACE ending is typical of enzymes, indicative of an enzyme. And it's either abbreviated ACHase or ACHE. And the purpose of it is to break apart acetylcholine. And you might first think, well, why would you ever want to break it apart? Well, we'll explain as we go on. In the picture on the lower left, it just shows a synaptic knob even larger. These are kind of like cartoon images, but it conveys the idea. So here's the an even more enlarged view of the synaptic knob. And inside the knob are these little synaptic vesicles. Vesicles are little sacs that contain the neurotransmitter chemical. Here's the muscle cell membrane. Notice the slight cleft or gap 
and there's sodium ions in this extracellular fluid. Here you can see a box, and we're going to enlarge this area, which we did last time. And here it's enlarged or magnified even further. Now we can see the synaptic knob. These are the vesicles containing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is being released, and it's diffusing across this synaptic cleft right here. And where it attaches, it attaches to the acetylcholine receptor sites on the surface of the skeletal muscle cell membrane. Now, interestingly, here you can see the receptor site, receptor site. When the acetylcholine attaches to the acetylcholine receptor site, it activates it, causing an opening up of sodium ion channels. I think we talked about this at the beginning of class today in terms of that essay topic of signal molecules. And I've given you this example exactly that way back in section B, around B25. So we had said that acetylcholine, when it activates an acetylcholine receptor site, it causes an opening up of sodium ion channels. Uh, and uh, then sodium ions start to flow down their concentration gradient and electrical gradient in the into the skeletal muscle cell. This flowing of sodium ions into the muscle cell generates an action potential in the skeletal muscle cell, causing it to contract. Now, uh, because what's opening these sodium ion channels is a signal molecule, which is also called a ligand, these are known as ligand-gated sodium ion channels. Could have called them signal molecule sodium ion channels, but they call them ligand gated. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's, on page uh, 54, on page 54, this is just another diagrammatic view of what we're talking about. So uh, here it shows uh, the acetylcholine molecule right up here. And it shows it attaching to this receptor site on the muscle cell membrane. This is the muscle cell membrane. This is the acetylcholine receptor site. And incidentally, surrounding it are proteins embedded in the cell membrane that act as enzymes. That's the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. Now, you'll notice that when the acetylcholine attaches to the receptor site, as shown right here in the lower picture, when the acetylcholine attaches, it opens up, creating a sodium ion channel. Now, there are many models as to exactly how this is working at the molecular level. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we're going to deal with the details of synaptic transmission. Let me remind you that this is covered both in your textbook and I've got videos that uh, show it as well. Uh, all that I did here is, uh, what we're looking at is this is the synaptic knob. And uh, what I did is I tried to make the picture look a little bit more like the synaptic knob by just kind of drawing these lines here. All right, so you can do that. You don't have to do it. But this is the synaptic knob. This is the synaptic cleft, that gap between the synaptic knob and the muscle cell membrane. This is the muscle cell membrane. So now we're really looking at this at high magnification in tremendous detail. And uh, so uh, you'll notice that uh, right here are the acetylcholine receptor sites. And you'll notice they're labeled nicotinic cholinergic receptors or nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. We'll get to that, though. Now, as you look at this picture, uh, you'll notice that it's got numbers. And here's number one, and number two, and number three. And it's showing a sequence of events that occur at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, we're going to walk you through each of these steps. They are all fully described. I wrote this out in my own words right down here. Now, why do you want to know this? Because I mentioned last time this is a possible essay question on the next exam. So now we have your attention. All right, This is a, this is a very important subject. So again, what we're looking at, and I just labeled it here, this is the synapse at, at the neuromuscular junction, the synapse between the somatic motor neuron and the skeletal muscle cell. 
So let's start with number one. Number one is just the action potential coming into the synaptic knob. Now we know what an action potential is. First sodium ions flow in, reversing the electrical polarity, and then potassiums go out, repolarizing it back. Uh, look, what did I write for number one? The action potential is conducted down the somatic motor neuron to the knob. Okay, that's what it shows. Now, number two. This is something I haven't mentioned before. This is new. When there's a reversal in the electrical polarity of the synaptic knob, it causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open up. And that allows extracellular calcium to flow into the synaptic knob. Now you say, you never told us that before. I know. Here's something new. <clears throat> so uh, uh, you'd say, well, did you write that? Let's see. Number two, the reversal in electrical polarity at the synaptic knob causes an opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Yeah, that's exactly what I wrote. Why are they called voltage-gated calcium channels? Because what causes them to open was a change in the voltage of the synaptic knob when it reversed electrical polarity. Now, why? Why does calcium have to flow in? Why do we even care? Calcium has to flow in to cause the neurotransmitter to be released. This is really a, a common concept. Calcium has to flow into a neuron in order for any neuron to release its neurotransmitter. And not only does calcium have to flow into a neuron for it to release its neurotransmitter, it has to flow into an endocrine cell in order for an endocrine cell to secrete its hormone. So calcium plays a very important role in secretion, in the release of a chemical from either a neuron or a, the release of a hormone from an endocrine cell. You'd say, did you write that? Let's see. Number three. The entry of calcium into the synaptic knob causes the exocytosis, which is just another word for secretion, of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So that's what it's showing in this picture. Here's number three. The, uh, the synaptic vesicle fuses or unites with the membrane, and it releases the acetylcholine. Now what's it show going on here? Here's the acetylcholine diffusing across the synaptic cleft, and at number four, it shows it binding to the acetylcholine receptor site. Now, we've mentioned that the acetylcholine receptor sites on skeletal muscle cells are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And as acetylcholine binds to the receptor site, it causes an opening up of sodium channels so that sodium ions start to flow into the muscle cell. Because the sodium flows in, in response, because these sodium channels open in response to a neurotransmitter, they're called ligand-gated sodium ion channels. <clears throat> and the sodium flows in. But let's see what I wrote for number four. I wrote, the acetylcholine diffused across the synaptic cleft binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor sites on the membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Number five, activation of the acetylcholine receptors causes an opening of the ligand-gated sodium channels. Yeah, that's what I said. As the sodium flows into the skeletal muscle cell, it depolarizes to the threshold, triggering, causing an action potential in the, in the muscle cell. Now, this action potential is going to spread along the muscle cell, and that's what's going to cause the muscle cell to contract. Now, uh, let's, let's go back up here. So the, now we've got this action potential, and it's causing the muscle to contract. Look what's here. This is the acetylcholinesterase enzyme on the muscle cell membrane. And what is it doing, number seven? The enzyme is breaking apart the acetylcholine into choline and acetate, or acetic acid. So it's breaking apart the acetylcholine. You'd say, what's that going to do? As the acetylcholine is broken apart, the, uh, it, it will be break apart the acetylcholine, and the sodium channel will close, and the muscle cell will relax. You'd say, did you write that? Let's see. Uh, down here, uh, number uh, uh, eight, the acetylcholine at the receptor sites is split into acetate and choline. Sometimes they call it acetic acid or uh, uh, acetate. And choline by the acetylcholinesterase 
an enzyme on the skeletal muscle cell membrane. The ligand-gated sodium channels close, permitting the skeletal muscle cell to relax. And then we wrote that the acetate and choline are actively transported back into the synaptic knob, and that's known as active reuptake. You'd say, where's that? That's right here. So here it shows, number eight, that the choline is being transported right back up into the synaptic knob. It will be rejoined together with acetate to reform acetylcholine so that it can be re-released again. That's called reuptake. Now this concept of reuptake of the, uh, of the uh, uh, choline back into the synaptic knob uh, we're going to see appears uh, 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 at many neurons, at many synaptic knobs. So let me give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Prozac? Yeah. Right? Some of you are thinking, I could use some right now. <laughs> All right? Prozac and Lexapro and Paxil are members of a class of drugs known as SSRIs. Has anybody ever heard that term, SSRI? Does anybody know what SSRI stands for? Okay, go ahead. A selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. We're going to tell you more about this later, but it stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. You'd say, what does that mean? So uh, the way that Prozac and drugs in this class work is they are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They inhibit... Now, we're not talking, in this, right now in this picture, we're talking about acetylcholine, not serotonin. But we will be talking about synapses in our brain that where serotonin is released as a neurotransmitter rather than acetylcholine. And what the way these drugs work is they prevent the reuptake of serotonin back into the knob so that the serotonin remains in the synaptic cleft. All right, so they are called serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, uh, but normally, the neurotransmitter is taken back up into the knob. All right, so you should know these details. Let me uh, uh, remind you that we've given you lots of resources. And so we'll look at one resource real quickly here. Okay, so here's the physiology page. We'll scroll down. And uh, incidentally, here's the lab stuff right here. And this is where I've got the uh, links to uh, the answers to the uh, problems. Uh, and then as we scroll down, here's neurophysiology. That's what we're dealing with. And here's action potentials. And here's synaptic transmission. And right here, neuromuscular junction. Let's click on that. And... Uh, We'll briefly watch this. Let's see if any of this makes sense. An action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal, causing voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open, increasing the calcium ion permeability of the presynaptic terminal cell membrane. Calcium ions enter the presynaptic terminal and cause vesicles to release their neurotransmitter acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicles into the presynaptic cleft. Diffusion of acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft and binding of acetylcholine to acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic muscle fiber membrane causes an increase in the permeability of ligand-gated sodium ion channels. The movement of sodium ions into the muscle cell results in depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. Once threshold has been reached, a postsynaptic action potential is generated and is propagated over the muscle cell membrane. Acetylcholine is rapidly broken down to acetic acid and choline in the synaptic cleft by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. The choline is reabsorbed by the presynaptic terminal and combined with acetic acid to form more acetylcholine, which enters the synaptic vesicles. Well, I think that's pretty much everything we said. So now, I think that if I hadn't walked you through that and you would have listened to that, it would have sounded like a bunch of mumble jumble. All right? But you could follow the words that we've learned, the vocabulary. Uh, not only do you have the, uh, the video link, but I think I've shown you this last time. Uh, all of this is in your textbook. Yeah, 
So uh, in the uh, textbook, uh, it's right here, page uh, four. Whoops, I got to switch things here. Okay, so page 442, here's the synaptic knob in color, and you'll notice they also have these steps numbered, and they walk you through that in the book. Here's the voltage-gated calcium channels, here's the ligand-gated uh, so sodium ion channels, so it's all right there. All right, page 442. <clears throat> all right, let's, uh, uh, now I have talked about the uh, synaptic transmission. So hopefully everybody understands this. Let, let's summarize it one more way, one more time. On page 54, on page 54, so we looked at this earlier, uh, we said that the acetylcholine binds to the receptor sites, opening up sodium channels. The sodium goes in, it causes depolarization, leads to an action potential, which causes the muscle to contract. Uh, what I wrote here is true, but just cross it out. We're not going to deal with it. Uh, it's kind of an advanced clinical topic, we're not going to get to that. But we can summarize that somatic motor neurons uh, excite our skeletal muscles to contract. And we use the word excite and depolarize interchangeably. The way that a cell is excited is by depolarizing. When it depolarizes, it becomes excited. Now, I think you understand the details. We've uh, explained that so you could follow that video. Uh, but let's see. Let's see. We're going to give you some clinical applications to really make sure you understand what's going on here. So I first want to talk about neuromuscular blocking agents. And if you're thinking, are we talking about a lot of drugs in this class? I said you will learn more about drugs in this physiology course than any other prerequisite course. Uh, neuromuscular blockers, just from their name, sound like they block at the neuromuscular junction. Now, we've talked about blockers before, antagonists. These are drugs that attach to a receptor site and just block it. Uh, these specifically block nicotinic, and you can add the word nicotinic, acetylcholine receptor sites on the skeletal muscle cells. Now, if you prevent, if you block those acetylcholine receptor sites, that would mean that even, even if the somatic motor neuron releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, the acetylcholine will be unable to attach and activate the muscle to contract. So the result is called flaccid paralysis. Flaccid paralysis. Let's show you a picture of this. Uh, make a note uh, to see page 56A. 56A. And on 56A is an extraordinary picture that I've made. Okay, yeah, it looks like a cartoon. All right, and this is showing on page 56A, neuromuscular blockers. Now, here I show uh, acetylcholine being released from the synaptic knob. This is the synaptic cleft, this is the muscle cell membrane, and these are the acetylcholine receptor sites, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor sites. But this symbol here represents the neuromuscular blocking agent. This is the drug. And this drug is attaching to the acetylcholine receptor sites. Well, hmm? well, we'll get to what it's for in just a moment. The, so uh, th this is a, a attaching to the receptor sites. And for as long as it remains attached, the acetylcholine now is unable to activate those receptor sites. So if you can't activate the receptor sites, the muscle stays relaxed. This is called flaccid paralysis. So I wrote this. The neuromuscular blocking agent attaches to the receptor site, preventing ACH from exciting the muscle to contract, so the muscles remain relaxed. So that's called flaccid paralysis. OK, now, why would you want to do that? There are many reasons. OK? Hmm? Yes. Let, let's go back to page 54. Back on the bottom of page 54, an example of a neuromuscular blocker is Karari. If you've heard of it, fine, and if you haven't, don't worry about it. I'm not going to ask you the name of a specific drug, just this category of drug. Now, on uh, the next page, 55, so one of the uses of these drugs is they're used as a skeletal muscle relaxant during surgical incisions. You see, when they take a scalpel, when they start to cut through the muscle, 
it causes the muscle to start to contract. And if you're cutting as the muscle is contracting, it tears the muscle. So they can give topical injections around the muscle to cause it to be flaccid and prevent it from contracting. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that prevents tearing. Uh, that's one use. Another use, even more importantly, is that it's used to relax the diaphragm muscle during general anesthesia so the patient doesn't fight the respirator. You might say, what does that mean? So when they, you're up here, they put somebody, let's say they're giving general anesthesia, right? They put the person on a ventilator, they administer the anesthesia. The way the ventilators work, the ventilator, now you're, you've used the ventilators? Okay. So uh, how do the ventilators work? Do, do they automatically synchronize with the person's breathing? Okay, let me say this. Correct me if I say anything incorrectly. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that can happen, just because somebody is out, right, they're under general anesthesia, doesn't mean that their brain may want them to exhale at the same time that the ventilator wants them to inhale. Is that, is that why I'm saying that right? Right, so the, the idea is the person's body may want to inhale or exhale, and at that same moment, the ventilator's trying to do the opposite. So the, we would, the expression they use is the person's body is fighting the ventilator. It's out of phase with the ventilator. So one of the things they can do during surgery is they can just paralyze the muscles. If the muscles can't contract, then they can't fight the ventilator. So uh, they use neuromuscular blockers to do this, uh, like Harari. Uh, obviously, uh, they've got to keep that person on a ventilator until this drug wears off, because if they take them off the ventilator, they can't breathe on their own, because the, all their skeletal muscles are in a state of flaccid paralysis. Now, uh, something you should be aware of, therefore, is the most important skeletal muscle in the body is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. It is a muscle that is under voluntary control. At least it can be. Look. <laughs> I'm voluntarily doing that. Now, uh, you might say, yeah, but most of the time you're not, we're not consciously thinking about using our breathing muscles, our diaphragm. That's true with all your muscles. That's true with all your muscles. Right now, you're using your back muscles to keep you sitting up. Are you thinking about it? No. So your brain can subconsciously control these muscles, or it can consciously, voluntarily control the muscles. It can work both consciously and unconsciously. So whether you're using your back muscles and you're just letting your brain do it automatically, or you move your back voluntarily. All right, same thing is true with our diaphragm muscle. We can either consciously, voluntarily go, huh, 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 or you can just let your brain control it subconsciously. And there's control centers in the brain stem that do that. We'll learn more about that, how that works. So this is another use. The, some, a lot of these neuromuscular blockers are used as what are called muscle relaxants. And they have multiple uses. Now, probably just the other day, you were wondering, how does cobra toxin work? Okay, probably you weren't asking that, but we're gonna tell you. Cobra toxin, the venom released by a cobra snake when it bites, works exactly like a neuromuscular blocker. It works just like we showed on page 56A. This venom and the snake basically bites, it enters the bloodstream and it's carried everywhere in your body. And this uh, venom starts binding to the acetylcholine receptor sites on all the skeletal muscle cells of the person's body. So they cannot walk, they cannot move their arms, but they die from what? They can't breathe. The most important, of the, you don't die because you can't walk. You are paralyzed, you can't walk, but that hasn't killed you. You die when you can't breathe. So the most important of all the skeletal muscles is the diaphragm, the breathing muscles. Because when it stops, you stop breathing. So uh, that's what death results from with uh, cobra venom. Uh, incidentally, I mentioned that uh, in India, 
they have approximately 20,000 people a year who die from cobra bites. Now, I, uh, a few years ago, I mentioned that. I actually said a couple, few years ago, I said 10,000 people die a year in India from cobra bites. And we had a, a lab tech from India, and she overheard me saying that, and she said, oh, I don't think that's true. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, go, 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 why don't you Google it and see? And, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but you check it. Well, she did Google it. It was 20,000 a year. So I, I was wrong. It wasn't 10, it was 20,000 a year. Now, that, that's a lot. But remember, India has almost a billion people, right? It's about almost 800 uh, million people, so 20,000 isn't you know, a lot out of that proportion. But the, uh, there are tropical parts in India where they have cobra snakes. And the problem, of course, is there is, uh, uh, if, if this venom stops the person from breathing, you've got four minutes, five minutes before they, they go brain dead, you know, and they die if you can't get them on that ventilator. So usually where they're bitten by a snake is out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, they don't have ventilators that are available. I mean, frankly, if you were bitten by a cobra snake right here, and we don't have cobra snakes, but let's say if you were, you'd be dead by the time the ambulance got you to the Cedar sinai Hospital or Brahman Medical. You'd be dead. <laughs> now, they've got a ventilator in the uh, ambulance, but... Huh? Yeah, but in the middle of India, where they're right. bitten, they don't have, oh, they're, they're, everybody's walking around with an anti-venom kit. Yeah. So, uh, you'd be waiting more than five minutes for the ambulance to arrive. <laughs> are, are they expensive, the anti-venom? No, but it's just that people don't carry around with them. You know, that's, uh, whatever it costs, it costs a, you know, more money than a lot of people would have. All right, anyhow. We're not going to focus on, uh, I'm not, I promise no essay questions on Cobra Venom. Uh, now, back on page 56, I'm sorry, 55, 55. On 55, here's another class of chemicals we want to introduce you to. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Now, what does that do? Well, from its name, this is an enzyme inhibitor. We know many things work as, by inhibiting enzymes. It stops acetylcholinesterase from working. Let's remember, what's acetylcholinesterase for? It breaks apart the acetylcholine. Why do you need to do that? So a muscle can relax. Because if you don't stop the acetylcholine from working, then the muscle stays contracted. So if the muscle, if you stop the enzyme from working, the muscles remain contracted, and that's called spastic paralysis, as opposed to flaccid paralysis. Spastic paralysis is when the muscles are paralyzed in the contracted state rather than paralyzed in the relaxed state. Let's show you a picture. I wrote C, page 56B. So let's look at 56B. And oh, another amazing picture here. OK, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So remember, the acetylcholine is being released from the synaptic knob. It binds to the acetylcholine receptor site. That causes an opening up of the sodium channels. The enzyme acetylcholinesterase normally then breaks apart the acetylcholine, the sodium channels close, and the muscle relaxes. But what if they, the enzyme has been inhibited? If the enzyme has been inhibited, the sodium, the acetylcholine remains attached. The sodium channels remain open. The muscle keeps generating an action potential, another 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 action potential and the muscle stays contracted. All right, and this is called, what I just wrote, I wrote there, what I just said I wrote, and that's called spastic paralysis. What do you die from? Again, spastic respiratory paralysis, paralysis of the diaphragm. If all the muscles in your, in, in your arms and legs contracted and wouldn't relax, that hasn't killed you. You just can't move. But when your diaphragm stays contracted, you can't breathe. Let's remember how we breathe. We breathe where our diaphragm muscle contracts, which causes us to inhale. And then our diaphragm relaxes, which causes us to exhale. So our diaphragm contracts, then it relaxes. It contracts, and it relaxes. We inhale, we exhale. 
If, you can, if your diaphragm won't contract, then you cannot inhale. If your diaphragm contracts and won't relax, you cannot exhale. That'll still kill you. Let me demonstrate what it would look like if you inhaled but could not exhale. Ready? <gasps> In order to breathe, you've got to let out exhale so that you can re-inhale some new air. So in either case, whether you cannot inhale because the diaphragm is uh, paralyzed in the flaccid state, or you cannot exhale because the diaphragm is paralyzed in the contracted state, you're going to die. All right? So this, this uh, uh, will, will lead to respiratory paralysis. Uh, now, why would they use these? So on page, on page 56, on page 56, that's what these insecticides, how they work. Malathion and parathion and seven, the most commonly used insecticides are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Now they, they cause spastic paralysis in the nervous system of the little insects just like they would do that in our, in our nervous system. So uh, let's say that, and they sell these insecticides at every Armstrong nursery. They sell them at Home Depot. They've got them in most drugstores. These are the most commonly used insecticides. So let's say that you've got some aphids on your roses, these little bugs. And uh, you want to kill these bugs. So you go to Home Depot. Uh, you say, what should I use? They say, hey, here's some malathion. Just spray it on those bugs. So you start spraying, and all those little bugs, they roll over on their backs. They say, save me, and they, uh, and, and they die. That was from the fly. Okay, the, so um, the, uh, anyhow, so they, they, roll, they roll over, they can't move. They die. Now, if a child were to ingest this insecticide, then they will die because they can't breathe. They're also going to be paralyzed with their, uh, their arms and legs, but they will die from being unable to breathe. Uh, now, as I talk about an insecticide, you might say, I don't care about insecticides. Well, I'm going to be a nurse. Don't you, can't you imagine there's been some children who have ingested insecticides? You don't think that's ever happened? Yeah, it happens, all right? Kids get into stuff, and, and usually the way this, the context of this appears, uh, somebody appears in the emergency room, there are kids there, the kid can't breathe, they've got them on a ventilator, and the nurse, the PA, they're asking, so have they been ill lately? Uh, wh wh were they exposed? Did you, wh 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 where did you find them? Why, they were, in, they were playing in the garage. W did they have anything? Were there any bottles there? I don't know, there was some bottles. Did they, what did they say? Do you remember what those bottles were? I don't know, could they have been? And here's where you're thinking, could, do you keep insecticide? Well, I think we have some insecticide. Could the child have gotten into that? Maybe. This is what, literally the way that things happen. Most people don't really understand that much, and your job as a clinician is to figure out what's, why that child won't breathe. The child's on a ventilator. They can't breathe. Before you know how to treat them, you've got to know what's causing the problem. So you've got, this is where you take the patient history, and then you're going to run various blood tests and so on to see what's going on. In the meantime, you keep them alive on a ventilator, but you don't know what antidote to give them or anything until you first know what they've ingested. Is it reversible for a child? Uh, if you get them soon enough. And, and of course, if they haven't suffered brain damage from not being able to breathe. That depends on how soon they got them on a ventilator. Can you, can you tell them? Uh, you can tell if it's spastic or flaccid paralysis, but there's other things that can cause these things. Uh, so as we're going to see. Now, uh, so these insecticides are commonly used. In fact, however, before they ever developed these insecticides to kill insects, they actually developed acetylcholinesterase inhibitors to kill people. They are called nerve gas poisons. The most famous of these is serin nerve gas. 
So uh, how the context, I'll give you a few, three examples of sarin nerve gas. Two of them are real, one is fictional. All right, uh, sarin nerve gas was used by Saddam Hussein. Now, I'm not saying that as a political statement. He didn't use it against America when they went into uh, Iraq. But he had used it against Iran. A lot of Americans don't know that Iraq and Iran were at war with each other for over 10 years. And there were whole towns that were basically, the, uh, every person was killed by the use of sarin nerve gas. That really happened. I'm not making a political statement. It really, you don't believe me, just Google it. Okay, just sarin nerve gas, Iran, Iraq. You'll see it, it, it was used. Most people who come, whose families come from Iran will tell them that yes, they are very aware of uh, that uh, there were many people uh, who were killed by uh, sarin nerve gas. So it was well known. Why he didn't use it against the US, I have no idea, I'm not getting into that political thing. But the soldiers were prepared. They had an antidote with them, in the, and they were in protective moon suits uh, in case they, they were to be exposed with sarin nerve gas. Uh, another example that really happened about 15 years ago, a revolutionary group in Japan released canisters of sarin nerve gas into a Tokyo subway. Does anybody remember this? And about 400 people died in a Tokyo subway. Again, if you don't believe me, just Google it. Tokyo subway, I, I, it was about 15 years ago, just write sarin nerve gas. Just put nerve gas, and you'll see. About 400 people died. Now, uh, there, here's, those, those are real historical events. This, the third example is a fictional account. It's not real, but it's a great movie. There was a movie called The Rock that came out in about 1995, and this is a great action movie. If you like action movies, this is a great one. Uh, so I'll just tell you, because I, even though I'm three weeks behind schedule, I can't, I gotta tell you a little bit of the story. This, this is great. So in this movie, some bad soldiers get a hold of sarin nerve gas, which comes in these green balls, if anybody remembers the movie. And they, uh, they basically put them on Minuteman missiles that they have it placed on Alcatraz Island in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Now the nickname for Alcatraz Island is they call it The Rock. That's how the movie gets its title. And they contact the President of the United States and they eat demand, each one wants like a million dollars and they are giving the President 24 hours to deliver this money and if they don't uh, get the money, they're gonna launch the Minuteman missiles, release sarin nerve gas, over the city of San Francisco to wipe out the entire San Francisco. <clears throat> Which would make it nice then that we could all move up there because be, prices would be cheap real estate. But anyway, so, um, but, uh, uh, so the president you know, is not going to be intimidated, right? These are bad guys, right? So what does the president do? He calls in the Navy SEALs. Now the Navy SEALs are supposed to be among the toughest fighters in the world. So he sends in the Navy SEALs to get these bad guys. Well, if you saw the movie, you know what happens. The bad guys kill all the Navy SEALs, right? So they tell them to stand down, remember this? They machine gun them all. Now what do you do? Now you didn't want to do this. As the President of the United States, you didn't want to have to do this, but you've got no choice. Your Navy SEALs have all been destroyed. You've got no choice. You've got to call in Nicolas Cage. <laughs> So what the entire Navy SEALs couldn't do, is this right in the movie? Nicolas Cage is gonna do, one guy, all right? Now Nicolas Cage plays the part of Dr. Goodspeed or something, uh, right, is that his name? And he is a toxicologist with the FBI. Toxicologists are expert in poisons. That's his area of expertise. He's like, Sarah nerve gas, you know what this can do? He's, that's the kind of Nicolas Cage playing the part. Now, what Sean Connery is doing in the movie is so convoluted and almost so complicated, it's almost impossible to explain. Sean Connery is about 97 years old. <laughs> Nobody knows what he's saying. <laughs> and, and, but the, the, uh, the, he basically is supposed to have been a British Secret Service agent who was incarcerated in Alcatraz Island, and why he's important, I'm not giving the whole movie away, but if you, it's still a fun movie, uh, it's still a fun movie, he, he, is that he was, the, in the movie, he was the only person who knows how to escape 
from Alcatraz Island. In other words, he knows how to get in or out, out get back in, without being detected. So that's his role. But near, now, so the, between the two guys, they kill off all the bad guys. Navy SEALs couldn't do it, but these two guys can. And, um, uh, and then, uh, near the end of the movie, Nicolas Cage is wrestling with one last guy. And uh, he's got this serin nerve gas, and the bad guy tries to push it into the face of Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage shoves it right into his mouth. So he collapses. Now, Nicolas Cage has been exposed to serin nerve gas. He actually has a syringe with the antidote. And he pulls it out, and he puts it into his own heart. And that is how it's administered, right into the heart. It's got to go through the bloodstream as rapidly as possible. The only problem is, the way the, 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 the antidote is usually given is they use the buddy system. If you've been exposed, your buddy, you, each, you give it to each other. But he would not have been able to give himself his own <laughs> injection into his own chest. He would have already been too paralyzed to even do it. All right? But uh, anyhow, he saves himself. And then what happens at the very end has to do with the assassination of JFK, and I won't even get into that. So the, the movie's very, It's a great, you know, popcorn movie. <laughs> a lot of swearing and stuff, but it's it's great action. All right. So um, anyhow, that that serin nerve gas. So it, it does exist. It really does exist. It's one of those you know kind of lethal things that they always are worried about in terrorism and stuff like that. Okay. Let's mention a few other clinical aspects. What's polio? Now, uh, most of you have only heard the word polio. I'm actually old enough to remember when I was. In kindergarten and first grade, I remember, you know, memories of kids with polio. Polio was the biggest crippler of children. Uh, it was uh, uh, it basically, it, what it, polio does, it's a virus that destroys somatic motor neurons. By destroying the somatic motor neurons, it's a lytic virus, it ruptures the somatic motor neurons, and as the somatic motor neurons are destroyed, you can no longer send signals to your skeletal muscles. So you can't walk. So kids with polio, they get this virus, and then they, they would use braces, then they'd use crutches, and then they'd be in wheelchairs. Eventually they would die. Why do you die? What's the most important skeletal muscle? The diaphragm. And it destroys the somatic motor neurons to all the skeletal muscles. So eventually, they can't breathe. And in the 1930s, there was a major epidemic worldwide of polio. And in fact, it scared people so much because they had so many people and families who were dying and couldn't breathe and would die from polio and children dying from polio. It actually spawned a religious movement. Anybody know what it was? Christian science. So they basically, they didn't know what to do against this virus. There were millions of people dying worldwide, and it created a religious movement called Christian Scientists. So, uh, this is, uh, 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 that's polio. So the result of polio is flaccid paralysis. Does that make sense? Flaccid paralysis, because you can't, if the somatic motor neurons are destroyed, you can't move. You can't activate your skeletal muscles. Let's give another example, botulism. Now, many of you have had micro. Some of you might even be taking it now. So bo botulism <laughs> is caused by a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. For you microbiologists, that is an obligatory anaerobic gram-negative bacillus that produces an exotoxin, a botulinum exotoxin. What that botulinum exotoxin does is it prevents the somatic motor neurons from releasing acetylcholine. So even, uh, so since the somatic motor neurons are unable to release the acetylcholine, therefore you cannot activate your skeletal muscles. So you're going to get developed with botulism poisoning, you're going to get paralysis, flaccid, flaccid paralysis of the muscles, what would kill you? Yeah. Diaphragm, you can't breathe. So you've got to be placed on a ventilator. Now there is an antidote, an antitoxin. Uh, let's uh, mention uh, one more, myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease. This is when the immune system attacks the acetylcholine receptor sites. Specifically it attacks the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor sites. Now uh, make a note 
we're going to look ahead on page 165. And on page 165, we're talking about muscle pathologies or myopathies. And right here on page 165, there's a picture. All right, looks familiar. Here's a synaptic knob. Here's the mus skeletal muscle cell membrane. And these little boxes represent the acetylcholine receptors. Now, on the right, it shows myasthenia gravis. In myasthenia gravis, there's a widening of the synaptic cleft. And you'll notice there's almost no receptor sites left because the immune system is destroying those proteins. It is attacking the acetylcholine receptor sites. <clears throat> now, eventually, there won't be any acetylcholine receptor sites. So when there's no acetylcholine receptor sites left, will the neuron be able to activate the muscle? No. no. So the person experiences progressive weakening in their ability to move their muscles to the point where eventually they cannot move their muscles at all. They have flaccid paralysis. Can this result in death? Yes, because then you have flaccid paralysis in your diaphragm muscle too. You can't breathe. So that's myasthenia gravis. It's an autoimmune disease. So you might say, well, like, what do they do? Well, we've talked about this before. Back on page 56, so what's a possible, possible treatment for any autoimmune disease? Corticosteroids, which are immunosuppressants. All right? So they suppress the immune response to slow down the progression of the disease. All right, so that's a, uh, so again, you can see, and now, do you think I've told you every single problem that could arise at the neuromuscular junction? No. no, there are thousands of things that could go wrong. But right now, just with this short list, we've talked about insecticide poisoning, we've talked about botulinum, botulism, we've talked about myasthenia gravis, we've talked about polio, and all of these are problems with the ability to move. All right, so the, uh, the it, you, Again, you, all of these have similar symptoms, and you've got to figure out what's wrong. Uh, 